Good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to you all here today. I would now like to request Mr. Prashant Girbini, Honorary Director of Pune International Centre, to give welcome remarks. Thank you, Mithila. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking your time to grace this occasion, very, very special program from Pune International Center today. I stand here to welcome the Chief of Army Staff, General Bikin Rawat, former Air Chief Marshal T.G. Naik, a member of PIC and dear friend Sri Nitin Gokhale, the GOCNC General Sony, Senior Staff of Southern Command, Trustees of Pune International Center, members of Pune International Center and CASS, friends from the world of media, and all of you interested people from Pune who have gathered in large numbers. I have the privilege to introduce you to the dignitaries on the dais who need very little introduction. General Bipin Rawat, UISM, ABSM, YSM, VSM, knowing that this is a function where you have a lot of civilians as well, I did my own little study. Uttam Yuddha Seva Medal, Ati Vishistha Seva Medal, Yuddha Seva Medal and Vishistha Seva Medal. Was appointed as the Army Chief with effect from 31st December 2016. He hails from a family of Army personnel and joined the Indian Army in 1978. This is something many of you might already know. Before taking over as Vice Chief, General Rawat was General Officer, Commanding in Chief, the GOCNC in Southern Command, which is based here in Pune. He has vast experience in counter <coughs> insurgency operations and high altitude warfare, and he has commanded infantry battalion along the line of actual control and an infantry division in the Kashmir Valley. He is an author of many articles on leadership and national security. And instructional, and he had an instructional tenure at Indian Military Academy, Dehradun. He has a doctorate of philosophy in military media strategic study. We welcome you, General Rawat. If you all could please put a hand together to answer your question. to have you here, sir. We are blessed that Air, Mar Air Chief Marshal P.V. Nayak kindly agreed to chair the session today. <coughs> Air Chief Marshal Pradeep Pasant Nayak, PVSM, VSM, graduated with the 33 course from the NDA and was commissioned into the Indian Air Force on 21st June 1969. He was the AOCNC of Central Air Command and the Vice Chief of Air Staff prior to his appointment as the Chief of Air Staff. He has flown wide variety of combat and trainer aircrafts, HT2, Vampire, Hunter, all variants of MiG-21, and he is also responsible for induction of MiG into the MiG-23BN into the IAF. Air Chief Marshal Nayak has been directing staff at TACDE, that's the Tactics and Air Combat Development Establishment, and the Defence Services Staff College. We also have with us today General Sony. If you all could put together your hands to welcome General Sony, <laughs> both in the Southern Command based in Pune as well as for today's function. Okay. And that's a very, very special day in that sense. I should also introduce uh, our very own uh, Nitin Gokhale. Uh, after working for 32 years as a security and strategic affairs media practitioner across print, web and broadcast mediums, in December 2014, Nitin decided to become a full-time author and part-time media entrepreneur. A best-selling author, strategic affairs analyst, TV commentator, blogger, some of you would have read his blog called News Warrior, 
you know that he is a media trainer. He is also founder of a specialized website BharatShakti.in. Nitin is a popular speaker and a visiting faculty at almost all top Indian military institutions in, that includes the NDC, the Army, Navy and Air Force War Colleges, the Defense Services Staff College and the College of Defense Management. As an author, he has written five books so far on his insurgencies, wars and conflicts and it's currently working on a book on popular history of the 1971 war. Nitin's previous book, Beyond NJ9842, The CHN Saga, published in 2014, has been a bestseller. Some of you might recollect that a Marathi <coughs> translation of this book was released in Pune on a PIC platform by then Raksha Mantriji, Sri Manohar Parikrashi. Before we commence the program of release of the book and the discussion, let me also take this opportunity to very briefly talk about PIC. Pune International Centre is a think tank based in Pune, but not just of Pune. PIC works on publishing various policy recommendation papers on different domains. National security is an important <coughs> domain. Pune International Centre, in association with other like-minded organisations, has been organising Pune Dialogue on National Security for last three years which is attended by experts from Pune as well as outside Pune. This year we had experts coming from many other countries as well. We are particularly blessed that we have always had very active support <coughs> from the Southern Command. We are thankful to General Rawat, General Haris, and now we are looking forward to work with General Soni as we will do future editions of PDNS, the Pune Dialogue on National Security. Many of you here today worked on it. That's General Partankar, General Mehta, uh, Sri Sohoni, Sri Amita Malik, Air Marshal Gokhale. We produced a policy paper called Pune Dialogue on National Security. The convener of PDNS is Air Marshal Bhushan Gokhale. May I request Air Marshal Bhushan Gokhale to present a copy of the PDNS to both General Rawat and General Sohoni. With that, once again, I welcome you all here to this very, very special gathering. Thank you. Thank you, sir. May I now request the chairperson of the program, Air Chief Marshal P.V. Knight and Chief of Army Staff, General Bipin Rawat, to release the book, Securing India, the Modi Way. Staff General Rawat, many of my uh, gurus in many ways uh, who I have benefited uh, from their knowledge and their uh, expertise in military affairs, and I can uh, I mean, go on naming all of them. But there's General Chekatka, there's Air Marshal Gokhale, there's General Shami Mehta, uh, there's Air Chief Marshal P. V. Naik. Many of them here uh, who uh, have actually seen my own growth uh, professionally and have uh, helped me you know, sort of uh, understand the intricacies of uh, military affairs uh, in which I have tried to uh, specialize over the past uh, two decades or so. 
Uh, and uh, therefore, I'm grateful, all of you, sir, uh, for uh, being here. I'm overwhelmed. Uh, it uh, really puts a lot of pressure on me because uh, uh, all of you are much more knowledgeable than me, but uh, all that I do is to put together what all of you know and uh, put it together in black and white uh, in, in print. So I'm thankful to all of you once again. Uh, I've been asked this question since uh, 29th of September when we launched this book uh, in uh, Delhi. Honorable Vice President Venkaya Naidu uh, was gracious enough to launch this book in Delhi. Uh, the first anniversary of the surgical strikes in Jammu and Kash in uh, Pakistan occupied Kashmir uh, was on 29th of September, and we uh, symbolically sort of released the book in Delhi that day. And since those two months, the book has received. I'm happy to say thanks to all of you, uh, readers and supporters and friends and family. Uh, it has uh, received overwhelming response, I must say, uh, in the English edition. We've gone into a third print run in these two months. And, uh, thank you. and uh, I'm also, uh, being a boy, boy from Pune who did his college studies and partly, uh, was, I was born here in Pune and did my college here in Pune in the 80s. Uh, I, I've also uh, sort of asked someone to translate the book in Marathi like I did the Sayachin book, the previous book, and uh, the 1965, 50 years of 1965 book. It will also be translated in Hindi and hopefully it will reach more audience and more readers. Uh, the question that I've been asked consistently over the past uh, couple of months is, why did I write this book? And why have I called it Securing India the Modi way and why not the military way? Uh, there are several uh, aspects to the answer that I'll give you, but I'm not going to take much time because we want to discuss the uh, security uh, aspects and security policies that are being uh, followed. I wrote this, because, this book because uh, I've seen uh, the domain of security and strategic affairs and foreign policy uh, closely, uh, fortunately, uh, because of my uh, profession uh, over the past 20 years, as I said. And what I found was a very refreshing change in approach uh, in, the, uh, in the current government's uh, decision-making uh, abilities and decision-making policies. And uh, as luck would have it, it's always about luck and timing, as you would uh, agree uh, in life as well as in profession. As luck would have it, uh, many of the uh, people who are in positions of uh, extreme sensitivity and uh, you know, kind of very high positions, uh, which, uh, which they are almost like the final decision-makers, have been known to me, uh, have trusted me, have uh, reposed their confidence in me for some time. So uh, it started off as a, as a query uh, by a young army officer, I must confess, uh, General Rawat. One, it was, this was an army war college in February this year, where I go every year for uh, conducting a media capsule. And one of the young officers there uh, walked up to me and uh, was very agitated and he said, uh, you know, the media does not understand what we do. They always are uh, criticizing us and I don't know why, uh, maybe one of his colleagues was uh, part of the surgical strikes earlier somewhere. So he uh, said, you don't understand the difficulties that we face, the kind of difficult job that we do. So I said, no, that's not, uh, too, uh, that's not true really, you're generalizing. Uh, I told him that there are many people who are also uh, reporting uh, very impeccably uh, with a balance uh, that is, uh, of course, rare, but there are people who write about it. Uh, correctly. Uh, anyway, he went uh, half convinced, went back half convinced, uh, but that query by him actually set me thinking that uh, how much do I know to write about some of the recent uh, decisions and recent episodes that had happened uh, over these last two, three years. The surgical strikes in uh, Pakistan occupied Kashmir, for instance, or uh, the precise cross-border raid in uh, Myanmar, or the Pathan Court episode on 1st January, 1st and 2nd January 2016. And of course, there are several other uh, aspects of foreign policy, which we seem to be uh, sort of uh, getting uh, a new uh, treatment from the government towards these two domains. I didn't know much. I had written some analytical pieces, uh, certainly after all these things had happened. But when I started searching, I didn't have enough material for a book. So I first approached certain people. I said, can you give me the inside stories of this? Why? What happened? Who was involved? It was a tough task, a tough ask, I would say. Uh, but slowly, people started opening up, and the, uh, the germ of that idea started expanding. Initially, we thought we will, uh, the publisher and I thought we will confine ourselves to the surgical strikes 
the Pathan Court episode. Basically, the counter insurgency and some of these hard military power, use of hard military power done by uh, the government uh, and the role played by the military. Uh, we will confine ourselves to that. But as I started putting things together and uh, started getting more and more information, the book expanded from uh, just pure military operations to uh, the changes in policy that have happened in cyberspace, in, in, in space, in ISRO, uh, in foreign policy, for instance. Even in small little uh, administrative matters in the highest levels, at the highest levels of the government. So I thought, let me get everything there together. And uh, then, of course, uh, interviewing people was difficult, but again, old friends, acquaintances, gurus, they all came in uh, uh, to help. And I sort of gathered enough material to write this book. It took me about six months to write this book. Uh, and uh, I must say it has uh, squeezed a lot of juices out of me. Uh, I'm still recovering from that because uh, it wasn't easy to uh, put everything together and yet not be um, giving out all the national secrets or, or details. So I would say uh, I put in, in this book about 40% of what I know or what I was told, uh, keeping in view the uh, sensitivities involved in uh, decision makings at the highest level. And uh, I must uh, put on record uh, my uh, grateful thanks uh, to our current National Security Advisor, Mr. Ajit Doval, for having spared almost six to seven hours over a period of these uh, six months, and which, coming from an NSA, I think it's, it's a huge uh, contribution and a huge help to a writer like me, uh, who made me understand how things are changing, what are things. Uh, how uh, paradigm shifts are taking place in small little details. And I'll give you just one example. One of the episodes, one of the anecdotes that I've quoted in the book is about uh, some meeting in the PMO that was happening where Prime Minister Modi was presiding. And uh, some topic came up about how many islands does India possess? So the census figure said something like 1120. The Home Ministry said uh, something like uh, 1200. Uh, but nobody had a uh, sort of, there was no reconciliation of the figures. So uh, the Prime Minister turned uh, to uh, his NSA and said, why can't we get the correct figures? Uh, so he said, I'll, I'll figure out what to do. And there, there was an ISRO scientist uh, or the ISRO chief was sitting next to Mr. Mr. Dover. So he turned to him and said, can you help us get the exact count of the islands that India possesses? So on a war footing, uh, this was done. Uh, by ISRO, and ISRO is one of our best success stories in India, as many of you will be aware. Uh, and they came up with this uh, entire survey done through satellite, and they finally came to a figure of uh, 1,382 islands that India possesses, which is now apparently the correct figure. And then they gave attributes to those islands. What is the area? What is the soil uh, uh, condition of the soil there? Is it inhabited? How far is it from the nearest port? Is there a uh, you know, uh, way to cultivate the land there? All kinds of 34 attributes were given to those islands. And now there's an island development agency which has been entrusted with developing some of those islands for tourism, for various purposes, and also for strategic purposes. So in a way, small little details are being looked at very minutely by people at the highest level. Uh, they're doing that. Uh, we have the army chief here. We have uh, the former air chief with us here. Uh, they'll be able to tell you that uh, half the time, I think, uh, for them uh, goes in trying to get all arms of the government working together. Uh, and uh, that's the big challenge at the highest level, I would think, because everything else is on autopilot most of the time. And to give direction to everyone is their, uh, is their challenge. And that's where I think uh, I saw changes happening at the highest level. Accountability came in. Uh, a lot of uh, changes in the way police meets are uh, conducted with the director generals of police, which I don't want to give too many details, otherwise none of you will read the book. So <laughs> I'm going to uh, stop uh, in that sense. But I must say that uh, the common thread that I found uh, in the chapters that I've written, you can read actually, one of the uh, things that I'm very happy with in, in this book is that you can read each chapter individually, separately, and still can make sense of it. That it's not as if you, know, you have to read one chapter to understand the other chapter. So they stand alone also. Uh, that's maybe because uh, I've been a journalist for the longest time that I can remember and we are trained to sort of uh, put it precisely and concisely uh, and uh, that is what I've tried to do. Uh, I may not have the full picture, I'm conscious of that, 
uh, and I wrote this book because many a times uh, these kind of books are written maybe 20 years after the incidents, 20 years after the event has taken place, where then the memory tends to broad brush or airbrush uh, the events for uh, personal uh, aggrandizement or personal benefit. So, uh, in a way, sometimes that uh, uh, the memory uh, is uh, brought into your own uh, kind of a uh, thinking that you have rather than how the events have happened. So, uh, as we call it in journalism, as journalism is called the first draft of history, please treat this book as the half a draft of the history, if not the first draft. Uh, I may expand it uh, as we go along, as I get more information. I could have waited for this government's tenure to get over, but I thought, uh, since I've got all the information that I thought is essential to write this book, I wrote this book. Uh, whatever shortcomings are there in this book, and I, I know there will be a uh, lot of uh, people who will have different views, if not criticism of the book, they are, those are welcome. Please uh, uh, feel free to talk about it, write about it, uh, but uh, take it for what it is, that it is the first uh, half a draft of uh, recent history and uh, therefore I wanted to record it for uh, posterity. Uh, I'm sure there will be others who will come after me uh, who will have better access, will have better documentation, will have better, uh, I would say, understanding of the security situation or the strategic affairs uh, domain and uh, do a better book. But uh, it is uh, something that uh, is very close to my heart and full of it. Don't want to bore with it, uh, don't want to bore you with it. Uh, but uh, it is something that uh, I think will give you a short glimpse into uh, what happens at the highest level when critical decisions are taken to uh, send soldiers to do uh, very sensitive uh, operations when uh, you take on uh, a bigger adversary like China in uh, Dolom. The Dolom episode is also there. So I almost wrote the episode on uh, China, standing up to China almost simultaneously as the uh, the standoff with uh, China at Dolan, or people call it Doklan, uh, uh, sort of came to an end on 28th of uh, August. And I finished that uh, chapter and gave the entire manuscript in for printing on uh, 9th of uh, September. And by 29th, we were in the market. So it's been almost like a long form magazine story. If those of you who read Economist or in the old days, the Time magazine or Time Life, it is something of that kind, slightly high, uh, longer version of. Uh, Economist or uh, the Far Eastern Economic Review kind of stories. Each chapter will be something of that kind. So please read it. Uh, thank you for all your support. Thank you for being here in overwhelming numbers. And thank you once again, all the stalwarts here who have uh, come here uh, on, on a Friday afternoon. Uh, and thank you uh, especially to the Army Chief who actually has to travel all the way to the East uh, from here. But he took time off and I'm grateful. Uh, to him, to Pune International Center, of which I am also a member. But they have been very kind. Every time I've done a book, uh, this is the second uh, book launch that they are hosting in Pune. And I'm proud to be a Punekar in that sense, to be here. Uh, we could have done away with this uh, book launch because I had done a book launch in uh, Delhi. But I wanted to do it because I'm a boy from Pune, so therefore this is this function. Thank you very much and thank you for patience. With Thank you, sir. I would now request you all to start the discussion, please. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, we thought we will do, uh, General Rawat, people always want to know. Uh, when you look back and uh, you were part of the uh, decision making, you were the GOC three core uh, when the first uh, Myanmar uh, strike happened. He was the man who took uh, the decision on, on the ground. And um, in fact, uh, I must tell you this, that had Myanmar uh, surgical strike not happened, the JNK surgical strike would not have happened. Because J Myanmar in a way uh, gave a glimpse of uh, what kind of uh, uh, sort of cross-border raid can achieve and what it can achieve uh, strategically. So people want to know, sir, that uh, when you took that decision, what went through your mind and why did you take that decision? Well, we had had some setbacks in the east. When I was commanding three corps in Nagaland, I was responsible for the operations in all the northeastern states. Uh, it was in preceding the strikes that we carried out. Uh, we had a very major ambush by the 
Indian insurgent groups that were operating from Myanmar territory. And uh, this was one battalion, Sikh Dogra, which was in the process of deinducting for a for their peace tenure to Chandigarh. And when a battalion is deinducting, you know, there is a gradual. They had they were deployed along the uh, Myanmar uh, Manipur border. And when a battalion starts inducting from these forward posts, you know, gradual thinning out starts. You know, you start sending your baggage back gradually. In spite of all the instructions that you know they will be everything will be secured, you will move as convoys. But there is always a tendency to see an empty vehicle returning and putting some stuff in that and sending it back, sending it back at that time. So they had some empty barrels which had to be backloaded. You know they had some uh, ammunition uh, fired cases which had to be sent back. You know you have to deposit them in the ordnance. So everybody wants to complete their task before leaving. And in that uh, melee, a convoy of vehicles was masked off. Which was not really a convoy day when the road had not been properly secured, and maybe this activity is always watched by the insurgents, especially when a battalion is going in and a battalion, battalion, battalion is coming in. This kind of activity is always observed by militants, and they do take advantage of such, uh, if I may say, at times laxity on part of the troops. So when one of these convoys was coming, it got ambushed, and we had suffered some heavy losses. 18 of our uh, brave soldiers had been martyred in that uh, ambush. so uh, message had to be sent across firstly the battalion uh, their own uh, image and motivation had to be brought back and they had to be uh, rejuvenated and ensured that uh, these losses will not be will not go uh, unanswered and that if anybody takes action against the military the military will retaliate now the only way to retaliate was the insurgents had gone across the information was quite clear that they had come from across and they had gone across so various sites were acquired and we had planned the thing and there was no other option but to plan the operation so it was uh, the operation had actually been planned we had uh, planned the operation to say that we will go and strike at a camp and tell these people that uh, uh, this is not acceptable and that every time they do this to us the uh, the repercussion will be harsher and harder and uh, just when the operation was about to be launched is when i got a call from delhi and to say that uh, we need to do something and that the this must be avenged and that is when the chief of the army staff spoke to me and i also got a call from the nsa saying that do you have something in mind so i was little taken aback because i had already launched the troops for the operation <laughs> <laughs> and they were on their way so they said uh, what i said so the operation is already in progress and maybe in 48 hours they will strike they are just about crossing the border then we had to halt the team and get the whole team back to say that no they want to know what is the operation and something must be planned in a deliberate manner and it must be done uh, you know after full, complete details should be known to us what are we up to but without too many people getting into details so everybody moved into manipur and uh, we again got the officer who was to lead this operation back he then briefed them in detail as to what he was likely to do and uh, with a delay of then 4 days the operation was lost because we had to now we thought that it, it will now be a giveaway because people had moved back from the border so we had to completely change the route so we used to have a battalion in imphal called 12 bihar so all the para special forces boys who were to launch for the operation were made to wear the 12 bihar dress <laughs> and then <laughs> gradually overnight the post along the border which were occupied by 12 bihar but gradually taken over by these para boys and 12 bihar at night over two nights couple of posts along the border we turned over all the troops and then these boys from the para sf executed the operation and uh, as they were going in for the operation one thing that uh, possibly you know we had slipped up was what if you encounter some civilians en route and they detect you and they are myanmar civilians as you infiltrating what happens this was not thought of that what will they be encountering civilian that night because the infiltration was taking place over two nights and they did encounter three hunters who had dogs with them oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so they encountered them so they got hold of these three hunters with dogs they tied them up they had not carried morphine because you know we thought that the best thing would have been to give them morphine and put them to sleep for 6 hours <laughs> by the time the operation was over so they they tied them up they had to now leave a small party with these people so these three five dogs and three hunters these shikaris so you know you were now less with 10 people because 10 people were left behind to to address to look after these people and uh, ensure that no information leaks out and that is when the operation went and then when they went for the operation 
they found that the forward light of Badkas, which they were thinking was the forward line, because some kind of earlier reconnaissance had been done of this area. They found that there was nobody there, so they thought the post has been wicked. The, the insurgents have left. But then what happened was, it was breakfast time, you know, when we stuck the camp. And they found that the forward bunkers which were there, possibly the sentries had gone for breakfast. It was around 5.30 in the morning. And that is how the uh, our people first stepped into the sentry bunkers, and we occupied the sentry bunkers, the outer sentry bunkers. And then as we moved in closer, they found the sentry at the so-called uh, temporary gate. And why we got success was because uh, most of the people that time were having breakfast. So we struck the dining hall. <laughs> and that is where actually the success came because uh, while the two sentries were eliminated by the, by, by the team leader himself, who was a lieutenant colonel leading the operation, a Manipuri, Manipuri boy from uh, 21 para ISF, he was leading the operation. And uh, he silenced the two sentries and then they found the dining hall and they, they raided the dining hall and destroyed the dining hall. That is where the uh, major casualties uh, were affected. So what I would like to say is that this operation had to be done. It had to be a good operation. It couldn't, and there was no chance of a failure. I mean, if it had to be a failure, then uh, it would have been a big setback for the army in the sense that we had suffered heavy casualties. We went in to take revenge, and we suffered casualties in that so-called uh, revenge. And you suffer casualties there, then the entire thing fails. So it had to be ensured that it is foolproof. Uh, the secrecy of plans had to be maintained. And let me tell you the one thing very good that plans were not known even to the, except for the team leader who was leading the operation, nobody in his team knew the plan, that they were actually going across. They were told that they are just going to man the forward posts of this 12 Bihar battalion. They are turning over the posts because there is a threat that, that these posts will be raided and that we have information that the IIJs are going to come and raid these posts. So just to strengthen these posts, these posts are being taken over by the SF. So that is how the SF is moving forward. And that is why they are going in dress of the Biharis. <laughs> and that suddenly after they had gone in there, within two hours they were told that get ready, your meals have been sent here and you are out for the operation. Mm -hmm. So it was just that it was, uh, operation had to be done to get back the... Exactly. The, in the, fact, that success of that operation in June 2015, one year later was repeated in, uh, in uh, Jammu and Kashmir and by that time General Rawat was the Vice Chief, uh, having come to Pune and then from Pune gone to Delhi as Vice Chief. Uh, so, uh, would you agree, sir, because I got to speak to people who had planned that, that had that operation not been successful, then we would not have thought of you know, doing the same thing because there were voices from Pakistan that time when the, the Myanmar raid happened that uh, we are not Myanmar, don't even dare to uh, come into our uh, side of the border. And yet we did that. So, you know, uh, would you agree that that kind of bolstered the confidence and then, you know, that plan also went through? Well, I don't think so. Enough. If we had, uh, like I said, if we had planned an operation like this in uh, Myanmar, it's not that this operation in Myanmar had not been done earlier. Shallow operation going across, we've been doing it, you know, uh, what we refer to as bat action in JNK have been happening even earlier uh, along the front line. We've been doing it everywhere. But to say that this would not have happened in JNK, uh, I think uh, Indian Army is capable of doing these operations. It is just that because this was a major operation which had been planned and the government announced the intent and that the execution of the operation has been done. Here also it was decided that it will not be just one odd operation. If we have to do something, then the operation must be something which you can announce and feel proud of. It cannot be just one or two bad actions and say you went across and you raided a post and you got back. So it had to be something big. But uh, given the confidence of the Indian security forces, our special forces and our battalion that are deployed there, uh, I think uh, they are capable of doing it and this would still have been done. And uh, maybe uh, maybe we, people would want to know uh, in uh, just on this topic perhaps that if it if it's needed again sometime uh, are we still able to do it are we still capable of doing it? Well, there are other options available. You know, there are various means of uh, doing operations across the line of control, and therefore uh, those options are always being. Uh, you know, we are prepared for other options. It is not just this. You know, you don't repeat the same operation in the same manner yeah. because you do surprise. So if you have to maintain surprise, you always plan for something new. And it is always better to keep the other side guessing. Yes, very good. I will not ask you for specifics, but uh, also if you see uh, in this uh, past 7-8 uh, months, we have had a very tense uh, standoff with uh, China in that sense. But generally speaking, our uh, uh, infrastructure and some of our capabilities were seen as not being uh, you know, sort of uh, enhanced. But would you uh, uh, be able to tell the uh, people here that uh, the Indian military especially and the Indian army is now uh, actually uh, making plans and uh, 
overcoming the uh, shortcomings and the problems that we faced in certain areas like infrastructure like in some of our um, you know equipment and weapons what what was the uh, what, what how would you assure the people about uh, the future well, there are two aspects to this. One is development of infrastructure up to the borders, uh, along our northern borders, which I think is being uh, moved at fast pace. We are trying to ensure that uh, the roads move up to the border and then, uh, you know, you have other infrastructure coming up. You've got to have your uh, ammunition move forward. Your forces have to be moved forward. So all that is happening. In fact, a lot of uh, advanced landing rounds have been developed uh, in, the, in the forward areas. So I think that is uh, what we can talk about our preparedness and then of course the next issue is uh, getting your uh, you know modernized ammunition, your surveillance devices. So a lot is happening on that front also where a uh, lot of uh, ISR capabilities as we call them you know which is surveillance and reconnaissance elements being put in place and uh, the modernization of our weapon systems and uh, making sure that we have adequate ammunition to prepare for and cater for any contingency. So these issues are, I think, all being fast-tracked and we are getting very good support from the government. That's right. I remember you saying sometime, I, I know it's nothing part of the book, but I still want to because we are in uh, Pune and uh, Southern <coughs> Command is one of the largest commands here. And ex-servicemen, veterans have been always part of the uh, larger military family. Uh, many uh, veterans would like to, uh, perhaps uh, many common people would like to know that how you are uh, also looking after the veterans and you know uh, one of your focus areas has been the welfare of uh, the junior commissioned officers and the soldiers serving ones and uh, some of the veterans uh, the some of the measures that you've taken if you can just uh, give them a little bit of a detail yeah i have always believed that uh, no army can be successful if it doesn't care for its veterans because uh, where do the where, where does the army come from the army comes from the people we have, you know, it is from the amongst the people we select our people, uh, whether you join as officers or you join as uh, the soldiers uh, in the rank and file. But they all come from within you. I mean, all of you can join the army. You are most welcome any day. All of you, provided you meet the age criteria and the physical fitness and the medical criteria. So, but when you join the army, what is it that you look at? You look at the thing that if I join the army, what if something happens? What? after I have finished my tenure and have given the best years of my life to this great service of ours. So if something happens to you in service, what do we do? Do we leave the, do we abandon the family of that officer or soldier no. who has given his life in the line of duty or do we care for the family? So we got to care for them. Otherwise, why would anybody join the army or why would anybody risk his life? And then comes the veteran who served his tenure in the army and now is out back in the civil street. He is very much part of our extended family. And if we don't care for him, why then would again somebody come to the army? Because you know, as you go up and you grow in service and you grow in age, you need support. So that is very important. I think that is one issue that army cannot forget. That we have to look after those people who have laid down their lives or have been disabled. We have to look after their families and we have to look after the veterans. That is very important. Because if you don't do that, why would anybody take risk in the army? Let me tell you, Jammu or Kashmir, Northeast or any other part of the country, our soldiers have never hesitated to risk their life. Yes. Wherever they have gone. And why? <laughs> they have never looked back to see what will happen to my family and children back home. Because they know there is somebody who will care for them. Yes. Correct. And I think it is this aspect that enables the soldier to give his best. I think Indian Army is proud of that. Yes. So we will always ensure that uh, we will always ensure that anybody who's been a part of the uniform remains a part of the uniform up to his grave. So we say it is from the day you get commissioned till we till you enter your grave that the service cares for you. Yes. And and that is what it's all about. Now coming about you know the issue, next issue that uh, Nitin uh, spoke about is looking after the officers' welfare and then we have the other community which is a larger community which is a junior commissioned officer, the non-commissioned officer and other ranks. A larger part of the army is, is, is these people. Do we actually care for them? Yes, we do. But there are some issues which were actually which needed to be addressed and the first was 
you know, we've always looked at the rank and file and the promotion prospects of the officers, and we've always said we have a very pyramidical structure, and it's very difficult to get promotion in the army. It's it's very hard, and it's very tough. For example, I'll just tell you in the army, only 0.18 percent people uh, rise to two star rank. That is major general to lieutenant general. In the army, only 0.18 percent rise to this rank. So that's a very low percentage. But similar is the case with our JCOs and other ranks. Their pyramid is even steeper. So we had a thing which was pending for long with the government and that was the cadre review of the JCOs. It had been lying pending for over 10 years. And when I became the chief, I said the first thing that we will do, even before we talk about any further peel factor or cadre review of the officers, we must get the JCOs who are cadre review. So, and I think uh, this task was given to the AG and I must say uh, the AG, the present AG and some officers under him have worked over time and have got it through. So we've got the JCOs who are cadre review which, is, uh, which has been approved. To be implemented from 1st January of 18, the higher promotions of our JCOs OR, which means, uh, which is 1,40,000 promotions from uh, from a Jawan to a Nayak to a Havaldar to a Nayakta to a Suddha to a Suddha Major, which includes 457 new Suddha Major vacancies. So this is the promotion prospects that we, the government has approved to be implemented from 1st January 18. <laughs> the, the other thing that was, that was uh, really bothering us was, you know, in the JCO rank, we have something called honorary ranks. In the, uh, a JCO then gets an on retirement, becomes either a, or just before retirement, he becomes either an honorary lieutenant or an honorary captain. Now, these vacancies are very far and few between. Very selected few numbers get to rise and get these honorary ranks. So, we wanted this figure also increase. So, we told the government we want a 100% increase. Now, this was one issue which was also pending with the government for a long time. And why was it pending was because government was willing to give us 50% and we were looking at 100% increase. So the barter between 50, so when I became the chief, I said, okay, let's do one thing, let's forget 100%, we'll take 50%, but let's take it, because it's, it's, it's so long, you know, 7-8 years, you're just banging your head, let's take 50%, and after some time, we can ask for the balance 50. Mm -hmm. So the moment we said, the government approved, has almost accepted 75%. And, <laughs> and, and, and I, I, I would say that it's true, but, but the AG tells me that before the 15th January next year, which is the Army Day, uh, he assures me that this will also come through. So, so these are these are some of the issues that I thought for the priority and, and the That's wonderful. I think before I go to the, some of the uh, veterans here, I have one fun, uh, since you spoke about the government having sanctioned all this, I think uh, in my uh, own experience, and I'm sure there are people from uh, other arms of the government who have worked in the government, are working in the government, will agree. There have always been this feeling that everybody works in silos. But uh, since you have worked at the highest level, both as vice chief and now as chief for the past uh, 11 months, um, what do you think is the government's uh, outlook? I mean, I, I think there's much more synergy, but would you agree? I mean, coming from you, it would be much more authentic uh, rather than me saying this. Yeah, I think this synergy is making life tough because every time, you know, now you have lots of meetings uh, with the government and they invariably they invite us for all these meetings including in the CCS, very frequently we get invited. So there's a lot of interaction happening at the government level. And I dare say, why I'm saying it's taking a toll on us is because every time we have these meetings, it's always after 10.30 in the at night. <laughs> because every time you get a call from the office of the NSA, he says, you know, we'll meet at 10.30. Uh, and uh, there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it. But I would like the media to keep the reason out of that. But I was told, they say that, you know, why they call you at 10.30 is because they don't want to disturb a happy hour, which they believe happens between 8 and 10. <laughs> really great. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, in fact, um, I mean, that's why I said that, uh, you know, half his time perhaps as chief goes in uh, attending these meetings, which are happening more frequently. And I can tell you, as I said, that I put in only about 40% of what I came to know in the course of writing this book. And I can tell you that there were so many meetings uh, ahead of uh, the important decisions being taken during the standoff, 10th standoff with China, the surgical strikes, and other important decisions that have been taken, which are part of this book, some of them. Uh, you will uh, read some of it there. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, certainly they work, uh, you know, the longer hour than uh, we can, longer hours than we can imagine. So a big round of applause for the chief and his, and his team. But uh, may I now request um, uh, Mr. Sony, uh, who was a former IS officer and a very experienced man, to maybe give out uh, a bit of uh, his thoughts and his observations uh, in case uh, you... Yes, uh, please. 
Uh, maybe we'll have three, four minutes and we have a couple of others who want to speak. Thank you, Mr. Zoni. General Rawat and distinguished officers of the days, as well as the distinguished officers and ladies and gentlemen here, thank you, Nitin, for inviting me and my colleagues to speak uh, a minute or two. Uh, I just want to say what a wonderful effort it has been on your part, objectively and in such a balanced way, to set out details um, on such an important subject. There has been uh, um, uh, in what appears to be a gradual and then gain, uh, of effort gaining strength to turn things around in our overall approach uh, in regard to national security, particularly um, defense. Um, the Indian Armed Forces, and I believe I speak on behalf of everybody here, are the pride of our nation. <laughs> Every citizen looks up to them for the standards they hold, for the values they hold. They epitomize our culture. They epitomize our approach of pluralism. Every religion is honored in the systems. There's a lot for the civil side to learn from the Indian Armed Forces. And I personally, we are very proud. I wanted to just say that uh, on 21st August, President Trump made a speech uh, in which he defined a new role for India and Afghanistan. But more so also, he spoke of the uh, partnership with India in the Indo-Pacific region. And this is something which has wide ramification, many dimensions, uh, which need an interdisciplinary approach to study and uh, requires a multidimensional approach. Um, it was wonderful to hear uh, the Chief of Staff in his inimitable, insightful way, taking us into confidence about some very important events that have taken place. We thank him for the frankness with which he has spoken and the important measures that have been initiated by him, which will help the Indian Armed Forces. Surely, this will be replicated in the other two parts of the Sashastu Sena. Uh, speaking on behalf of myself as a of a civil servant who was associated with national security foreign policy, as well as working in a neighboring country, I must say there's another paradigm shift which is absolutely necessary. I'm very happy to hear from General Rawat that some of that seems to be taking place already. And uh, it, it is a great gratification that one hears this, but uh, about a year and a half ago when we were discussing this, the role of the ministries, the role of the ministries in government of India the um, people manning those ministries, um, from the political level, all sorts of senior civil servants. Uh, Ministry of Defense, of course, Ministry of Finance, particularly, and a number of other ministries. So we have desired, devised in the BIC in one meeting certain principles, which we felt were very important for that part of our scenario to follow. And with your permission, I'll just read them out. One was, this was addressed to people at the level in the ministries with regard to the armed forces. One, thou shalt not exclude the services leadership from consideration of and decision making on issues germane to national security and foreign policy. I'm very glad that that seems to be happening. Second, thou shalt not default in addressing and fulfilling as closely and promptly as possible the operational material and moral needs of the armed forces. Three, thou shalt not fail duly to acknowledge, honor, and respect the officer corps for their national service. Four, thou shalt not be found wanting in positively endorsing, justifying, and supporting for public knowledge the actions and achievements of the armed forces. Five, thou shalt not indulge in playing politics in and relative to the internal management of the armed forces. Six, thou shalt not thou shalt not be in denial, thou shalt not misuse, abuse or otherwise expropriate any facilities or concessions, whether financial or non-financial, movable or immovable, meant for the officers and other personnel of the armed forces and their families. And last but not the least, number seven. Thou shalt not deny or be in denial that the foregoing deadly sins have repeatedly been committed in the past 
to the profound detriment of the national state. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I feel that that approach, if it is followed, as it apparently is being followed now by the ministries, it would be in our national interest. It would help support the growth, development, and proper optimization of our armed forces vis-a-vis -vis the challenges faced. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again. Okay. Congratulations. Uh, can I request uh, Marshal uh, Bhushan Gokhale to also make his remarks a little bit? You want to come here? Yes. <coughs> General Robert, H. Marshal Mike, General Sony, Nitin, and of course Prashant here. Lady Chapman. In this era of breaking news, headline news, perceptions already made. And then we have this another animal called the social media. <laughs> and you'll be surprised that when Manamar action took place, General Rawat, within about five minutes, first of the Twitter had already gone in. And that's the power of social media. But what happens is the perceptions are made, sometimes wrongly. But that is where a seasoned journalist like Nitin who has brought out a book which is studied, which is authentic, and uh, must compliment you for putting this together. Because many of us, we have been hearing this business about India being a soft state. And I think this book categorically brings out the way the synergy has worked, the way the various apparatus of government have worked to brought the surgical strike both in Myanmar and of course across the line of control in Pakistan. Second surgical strike in particular I want to mention is because when cross-border terrorism has been going on for years and the overhang of tactical nuclear weapons which the Pakistani defense minister had been tom toming just before the strikes, we thought we don't have a space. But I must compliment General Rawat in the Indian Army that they carried out a surgical strike, absolutely so very good that we are very proud of the Indian Army and I deserve a very great clap from all of us. <laughs> I just want to talk about the synergy because soon after 62 war when Yashmandaramji Sarwan became the defense minister, there was this synergy which I brought about. For quite some time it was lacking. I'm glad that once again these things have started. I must bring in that the politician, the bureaucrat, the military, and of course the intelligence apparatus is most important in this synergy. Intelligence operations, and I find that uh, when I read the book, a very nice thing has been mentioned by the NSA, talks about the three curves, you know, the intention, the capability, and the opportunity, and how to deny these. You know, it's really worth reading that if you're coming directly from NSA, it's very, very carries a great weight. And lastly, I just want to say that uh, on intelligence, there is one thing which bugs me quite often, and I think in Pathan Court also we suffered that, and that is police verification. I think all of us who employ people at different various levels of security, the verification of individual, and we have suffered because of that, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much again for inviting me to add a few comments, and wish you all the very best. Jai Hind. Thank you very much, uh, Marshal Gokhale. Uh, can I now request uh, my guru? I first met General Chekatkar as a young reporter in Assam uh, exactly 20 years ago in 1998 uh, when I had just come out with my first book that was 20 years ago. It was on the insurgency in Assam. And when he took over as GOC 4 core, uh, he sent for me and I went uh, you know, sort of uh, with some apprehension in mind that have I done something wrong. But he put me at ease and there he is for 20 years, he has been holding my hand, guiding me. And therefore, sir, it's my honor to invite you to give us some remarks here. The dignitaries and the dais, ladies and gentlemen, as usual, the boy who was born in Pune continues to be kind at heart. I don't know why and how. But he is there, you can see. So I am grateful to you, Aditin. I never expected this from you, and that too from Pune. <laughs> you can see, they are acknowledging my remarks. <laughs> but I am grateful to you, and sir, to the chief, 
to the air chief, army commander, everybody. I've gone through this book earlier when it was released, Securing India, the Modi way. My interpretation has been Securing India, the Indian way. This is the thing I understood. And why I say this? I was reminded the month of September has always been very special month in the history of the humankind. All good things or the challenging events have taken place in the month of September. Not necessarily 9th, 11th or not even other sort. The surgical strike and so on and so forth. 29th of September. 125 years back, Swami Vivekananda. Now please don't misunderstand me when I say Swami Vivekananda because you know I suddenly get related to somebody else. He belongs to some tatwa. There's nothing on it, right? <laughs> he said in a speech at Chicago, I can see India rising. And he was born in Narendra. Probably he's another Narendra <laughs> who's trying to see that the dreams seen by our ancestors are coming true. And they had to come to Indian way. And he happens to be here. So therefore, the Modi way. When we say securing India, the Modi way, it is not only the armed forces. Of course, they remain the part of it. But there is psychological security, food security, economic security, industrial security. You name and it is there. Unless they all are in mesh together, synergized together, a security cannot be full fledged. And he has mentioned this in his book very rightly also. The other way uh, to look at is. When we say capacity building takes time, <laughs> it takes time. Chinese have done that over the last 30, 35 years, and they are they are where they are. India is now also it is not that our capacity was not there, but we are into that mira. Capacity building takes time. <coughs> Once your capacity goes up, your capability goes up. And when your capability and capacity both have gone up, your intention can change. And we have seen the example what General Robert told us of a strike in Myanmar. I don't think it requires any explanation. And the way the messages are going across, people are coming. So the world is looking at India with a great hope. With a great hope. And I think collectively, also the armed forces and the government and all the organs of government had to make sure that we come up and we stand to the expectation of the world. Only then it will be Indian way of showing the world what India can do. And that is the way this has been announced. Finally, there's a saying in Hindi and Marathi and Sanskrit also. When you say Rashtra Bhakti, Rashtra Bhakti, Desh Bhakti, Rashtra Bhakti ke liye, when they say Bhakti, it is not necessarily that you recite some mantras and you become Bhakti. No, not necessarily that. It is the total contribution of the humankind of that particular nation to build up the nation, to secure the nation. Rashtra Bhakti ke liye, Rashtra Shakti ka kawach hona chahiye. You need the shield of the armed forces to ensure that India is secure. And that is what we just heard from the chief of the army. Rashtra Bhakti ke liye, Rashtra Shakti ka kawach hona chahiye. At the same time, Rashtra Shakti ko, Rashtra Bhakti ka antakkaran hona bhi utna hi awashak ho. That is the first thing. Therefore, I was not surprised when our chief just now said, if they are not giving 100%, let's ask for 50%, and now he's saying it will become a 70%. That is the meaning of Antakya. You we cannot, we cannot, and we should not sometimes. Yeah, we know the problems of the things. But therefore, I compliment you, little once again. Hope I am sure this is the part one, there will be many more part of the things. And let me assure you, let me assure you, in years to come, in time to come, India has its way. The chief will probably tell you later on sometime, somewhere. Look at the number of people who are coming to India, seeking the cooperation from India, strategic partnership of India. It is happening over a period of time. They are not coming to look at Taj Mahal or Qutub Minar. They are coming for a different thing. And that is our hope. So thank you so much, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, sir. But uh, now uh, it remains for me to uh, request uh, Chief Marshal P.V. Naik. I must. Uh, Tell you again that uh, I did not know him until uh, he became the vice chief in, in the air headquarters. And when I came to Delhi in 2006, uh, and uh, in the course of my 
duties as a NDTV's uh, defense and strategic affairs editor, I requested him for an interview. So he first uh, dismissed the request and said, I'm not for all this, let me do my job. But he was kind enough to give me his interview. And I'll always remain, uh, I'll always remember one of his remarks. Uh, he, he was always bold in what he uh, said and what he did. Uh, in one of his press conferences when there were uh, a lot of concerns being expressed about the Air Force's depleting strength and you know uh, that we may not be able to take on our adversaries. So in, um, in a very um, unconventional way, he, when some Hindi reporter asked, Sir, we are very scared that the Bharatiya Vaya Sena is very strong. So since he knew the way the television channels operate and they like headlines, so he said, आपको डर लगता है पर मुझे नहीं लगता है क्योंकि भारतीय वायुसेना जो है वो कोई चुन्नू मुन्नू एयरफोर्स नहीं है तो डेट बिगेन वो हेडलाइन तू यूज़ डेट काइंड ऑफ अनकंवेंशनल लैंग्वेज इस व्हाट चीफ मार्शल पीवी नायक इस सर आई एम ऑनर्ड एंड ग्रेटफुल दैट यू एग्रीड टू बी द चेयरपर्सन � Staff, Lieutenant General Sony, the new GOCNC, Southern Command, Nitin, of course, and Prashant, who is sitting here. Uh, senior officers of the Army, Navy, and Air Force, retired officers serving as well, sitting in the audience, and uh, dignitaries sitting in the audience, and my friends, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. This is indeed I'd like to re-emphasize, this is indeed a, a very important occasion because outside Delhi, you don't get to see two chiefs and one uh, army commander on the same day. So, you know, it's a plus point for Pune and PIC. In the, uh, uh, in the U.S. Congress building, you know, there is a... This thing is written over there. I would like to share it with you. It is said that uh, all that needs to be said has been said. But everyone has not had his say. So here I am, the last speaker. Please bear with me. Okay. I have known Nitin, like uh, he said, since I became vice chief. Of course, I had heard of him, seen him on TV, like all of you. Uh, thereafter, of course, our uh, dosti continued. He mentioned an interview with me. We had a, when I became chief, we had a one-hour interview. I had one-hour interview with Nitin. And uh, before that, I had had, about three months before that, I had had a one-hour interview with Barkhada. <laughs> now I distinctly remember these two because the first interview was with Barkha. Thoroughly professional, mind you. She knew her gem and she knew how to interview. Beautiful. And uh, the only thing was that it was like French cricket for me. You know, I don't know if you're French cricket. You have a bat and people surround you and they keep throwing balls at you. you know? <laughs> and if it hits your leg, you're out. <laughs> so, you're, so I didn't know where the threat was coming from in Barkha's interview, really. I mean, I was sweating by the time the interview ended. Luckily, I didn't make too many goof-ups, so that was okay. Nitin's interview on the other side was so comfortable. You know, he's a man who's got services background. He is pro-services, there's no denying that fact. And it was very, very comfortable. In fact, I felt that I was talking to one of my friends, you know, over there. So it was a very nice interview. So that's how uh, we came to know each other. An honest journalist. It's a contradiction in terms, I'm begging everybody to <laughs> But, he's an honest journalist. I mean, uh, very, very nice. What he said, you could depend on, he could give you a lot of tips. I'm sure he continues to do so now, and uh, a very helpful person. Firstly, a little bit about the book. You must read this book with an open mind, like the author himself says. It's not an analytical book. It's not a book on emotional blackmail, you know, Padmavati and things like that, nothing like that. <laughs> it's not a statistical statement of, you know, tables and things like that, nothing. It's just an honest account of important events 
since the present government took over in 2014. For the uninitiated, for the uh, general civil public at large, it's a very, very good book. Because there are some tremendous insights which he gives into various operations, you know, into the uh, how the famous uh, strike across the border was planned, how was Myanmar, what happened in Doklam and all these things, there's a lot of energy over there. So for the general public, it's a very, very nice book to read. The next thing that strikes you while you go on reading the book is that it is, of course, pro-government. That strikes you very hard. After all, the title of the book itself says, you know, the Modi way. And he sticks to that title. The entire thing is how the government has functioned. Quite a bit of it, in my opinion, is true. <laughs> but, but throughout the book, another dilemma of Nitin's, the authors, comes out very clearly. What to write? And more so, like he says, when we come up told him, what not to write? Because I'm sure his gen is much more, you know. But he has restrained himself, you could make out, in the style of writing, etc. The information that has been put forward is interesting, and it is really worth a read. Now, generally in this book, he covers a very large canvas, you know. It starts with China, Pakistan, Myanmar, the surgical strikes, Pathan Court, very important. Doklam, Middle East, etc. All these things he covers. But you can make out that his heart is in the Northeast. <laughs> Nitin is a man from the Northeast. He was brought up there. He loves that place. And you can make out reading the book that he's given a lot of time and thought to what happens in the Northeast, what needs to be done there, which is the government policy, and which is rightly so. All of us would agree, I think. A lot of space has been given to defense. A uh, lot of space has been given to the problem, integration between bureaucracy and defense, the problem of integration in the Ministry of Defense itself, etc. And uh, one thing that clearly comes out and which I was very happy to read was the synergy between the Prime Minister and the NSA. It really comes out loud and clear. Now that is the way to go. And that is the way all intelligence agencies can be uh, together and where the information is required, the information is fed. Rather than having little, little islands of information all across, which is what used to be as far as the int agency were concerned. All in all, honest reporting by an honest media person, eminently readable book. Now coming down to this evening, <coughs> a few questions, few lectures, all of course, top of the line, I must uh, compliment General Rawat for his frankness as far as answering those questions about uh, surgical strike, Myanmar as well as the other one were concerned. And of course his concern for the welfare of troops, which has come out loud and clear. Chief has to be very careful when he talks to, you know, large public like this. I remember my days once, once, just shared this small incident with you. I was in Gandhi Nagar, so one of the chaps asked me, uh, reporters, sir, can you compare Chinese Air Force and our Air Force? So I told him, I said, hey, there's no comparison, they are three times our size. That's all I said. By the time I reached Delhi, wo to, they were, you know, going great guns for me. Chief says, all that. So, uh, the Raksha Mantri called me after that. I expected a jhad, you know. I said, so I told him, he told me what happened. So I said, sir, this is in public domain, you know, it's three times the last size, everybody knows it, it's there in James. So he says, no, I'll share one small thing with you. Uh, you know, when a minister or a big shot, a civilian person, he talks to the public, they listen to him. But when a senior armed forces personnel says such things, they listen extra carefully and they get worried. <laughs> so, you have to be very careful when you talk, you know. So I'm sure he wanted to tell you a lot more things, but he could not because it had to be seen. And so also with Nitin. So with this, I come to the uh, end of this talk. A very pleasant evening, and I'd like to thank PIC for organizing this evening, and thank all of you for your patience, for patient hearing. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Thank you, Air Chief Marshal.
Uh, we come to the uh, last segment of the program, and uh, it's my pleasure to stand here to propose a vote of thanks. First of all, a huge round of applause to for General Rawat for taking time out. And time. As a tiny token of appreciation from Pune International Center, I'm going to request Trustee of PSA and Treasurer, Mr. Ravi Pandit, to please come on stage and uh, to give a tiny token of appreciation on behalf of all of us to General Rawat. Mr. Pandit, please. Thank you, Mr. Pandit. We are also uh, very, very thankful that General Sony, the GOCNC of the Southern Command, uh, is, is here with us today. To thank General Sony, may I now request Trustee of PIC and Chairperson of Program Committee, Professor Amita Malik, to please come on stage and give a tiny token of appreciation to General Sony. Professor Malik, please. so much, Professor Malik. I must add my vote of thanks to Air Chief Marshal Naik. Please uh, give a round of applause for <laughs> Air Chief Marshal Naik has been part of the Pune Dialogue on National Security for the last three years and has been a guiding force on many aspects of uh, national security related uh, content produced at PIC. So thank you, uh, Air Chief Marshal. I must also thank the uh, staff of, and the senior officers and staff from the Southern Command because they took a lot of efforts in making uh, all of this happen and making sure that you know we do it as diligently as we could. Sure, we have a lot more to learn, uh, we being the PIC that we are uh, on, on this part of the world, but we will certainly and we'll continue to get better and better at doing this as well. Uh, please put your hands together to my friends from media because they are the people who would uh, take the message out far and wide. Thank you so much. Thanks for taking time and coming here. I must also thank the trustees and members of PAC and each and every one of you who have gathered here today. Thank you so very much and look forward to see you again at another PAC program. Uh, oh yeah, that goes without saying, the College of Engineering Pune. Thanks, Nitin. Uh, Professor Ahuja, who is here with us today, and uh, his staff, who made it a point that this becomes the biggest program. As important as any other aspects is the education and uh, without disturbing the exams and rest of it, they still made a lot of uh, arrangements to make sure that this program goes the way it goes. So we're thankful to you, Professor, and all of your team. Uh, thank you so much and thanks everyone and look forward to see you again at another program. Thank you so much. Now I uh, announce, please tell me. Sir, 7th of December is the Armed Forces Flag Day. And this year we have decided that I am sure the nation would remember the armed forces on this day. And uh, at least in the in Delhi, in the Ministry of Defence, we have decided to celebrate this over a seven-day period. And that's why today on the first time wearing the armed forces flag day flag on, on my on my day. But seventh December is the armed forces flag day, and I am sure you will not forget to remember the armed forces on yes, this day. Yes, yes.